Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series. Have you ever seen feats of ancient architecture like the Colosseum or the Pantheon, maybe in a history book or on a TV show and wondered how they were built or what life looked like at the time? Today, we're going to be taking a journey back in time with our friends at the Museum of Design Atlanta to learn more about ancient Egyptian culture, architecture, and technology. Now, I'm joined today by Thomas Hayes, who will be giving us an inside look into this, this exciting period in history and at how the museum takes a creative spin on that history with some very new age building materials. Now, before I hand it off to Thomas to get us started, I want to make sure everyone is ready to collaborate, to participate, and to build along during today's live lesson. We're going to have the opportunity to build along with Thomas and some of the things he'll be showing us today. And don't worry, you won't need any limestone or cement. We're going to be building along together using Legos. But if you don't happen to have any Legos handy, feel free to use Play-Doh, clay, pen, paper, whatever you have around to draw or to build along with us. You'll also have plenty of opportunities throughout the lesson to ask questions of Thomas and to answer the questions he'll have for you. So feel free to use the chat on the right hand side of your screen to ask and answer questions throughout the lesson. And if we don't get to those questions right away, we're going to save about 10 minutes at the close of today's lesson for Q&A. You'll also want to make sure that you have your cameras close by because during the end of the lesson, we're going to have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie. And if you tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as the Museum of Design Atlanta, you'll be entered for the opportunity to win an Ancient Adventures Camp subscription. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that prize and how to enter toward the end of the lesson. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and hand things off to Thomas Hayes of Museum of Design Atlanta. Well, thank you, Haley. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about ancient Rome and about some of the cool things that they came up with and did to build along with you guys and just have a great time taking a step back and learning a little bit about history here. Um, so let me jump into my presentation here. All right. So I would love to hear a little bit from you guys as I introduce myself here. So if you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat, I would love to hear your name, where you're calling in from. Let's see how far we, uh, we span in this class right now. Uh, and if you could go anywhere in the world, where would it be? So go ahead, enter that into the chat. We'd love to hear from you. It's always great to build a little community when we have our class together. Uh, and I'll go ahead and I'll introduce myself a little bit more formal, formally here uh, as you guys do that. So again, my name is Thomas. Haley gave a fantastic intro, but I am calling in from the Museum of Design here in Atlanta. Uh, and if I could go anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world, where would it be? I think I would actually choose Rome. The more I study it, the more I want to go there, the more I'm inspired by the things that they did in terms of their building and sculpture and art and everything. So I think if I could choose a place, I would choose Rome. So today we're gonna to get a chance to do that in some sense virtually. We're gonna travel back and see some cool things. But again, I'd love to hear from you guys. So go ahead and throw that into the chat if, uh, if you get a chance there. So real quick, I'll tell you guys a little bit about us, uh, about the Museum of Design here in Atlanta. We celebrate all things design. Uh, one big thing that makes us different from most museums is most museums tend to look towards history and look towards the past. We love those guys. We love those museums like there's no tomorrow. But what makes us different is that rather than looking backwards, we look at the future. And we try to look at the different ways that design is being used to make the world a better place. So that'll be everything from a, an exhibit we just had about bike design and really cool designs in that uh, realm of things to things like designing new structures for people in need, new houses, uh, pretty much everything design. So that's us, we're here in Atlanta. So hopefully, hopefully if anyone is in Atlanta, you can come visit us. But if not, check out our website. Uh, we have virtual tours and all things like that. So that's a little bit about us but I think we are all here for ancient Rome. So again, let's use that chat for a second. I would love to hear what you guys know about ancient Rome. Uh, what comes to mind when you think of it? Maybe who comes to mind? If there's any buildings, uh, big hint there, uh, or anything like that that comes to mind when you think about ancient Rome. So go ahead, you guys, take a second, enter stuff into the chat. 
Um, I'm sure we'll be seeing some really cool stuff in there, and I'm sure we're going to go over some of the things you guys are going to put it, put into the chat as well. Um, but before we get into all that, I have a trivia question for you guys. Get us started, get us into that Rome mood. How many years did the Roman Empire last? So take a second here. I know this is going to be a guess for most people, but how many years did the Roman Empire last? Is it A, 450, B, 7 million years, C, 1,000, or D, 146? How many years did the Roman Empire last? All right. So the answer is C, 1,000 years. So the Roman Empire spanned over a thousand years. Um, their history goes on for a little bit before that and a little bit after that. But the general bulk of Roman, uh, the Roman Empire and its history that we know took place over the course of about a thousand years. Um, so in those thousand years, they did a whole lot. At its biggest point, at its greatest point, the Roman Empire expanded to cover up this much of the map. So if you look right over here to like, I don't know, the top left almost, you'll see Rome, a little dot right there. But all of this purple land was part of the Roman Empire at one time. So they were very successful. They weren't always very nice about how they came to acquire that land. Um, a big part of why Rome was able to be so dominant and kind of conquer so much of the world was due to quite a few things. But mainly due to the fact that they were very advanced um, with their army and their legions uh, and all the technology that came along with it. So we won't talk a, a lot about those guys and get into the nitty gritty there, but it's important to know that that is a very big part of why uh, the Roman Empire was so expansive and successful. So Roman history, and I won't talk you guys' this year off about this part, but I want to break it down for you before we get into uh, the really, really cool stuff we have for, for the majority of the class here. But just to show you a little bit of, of the timeline of ancient Rome, it's broken down into three major periods. You have the Regal period, you have the Republican period, and then you have the Imperial period. So the very first one is the Regal period. And this is at the very, very start of Rome. And at this point, it was more of a village, more of a little town than, you know, a massive city or an expanded empire as it was by the end. So Rome was founded, uh, according to mythology, by two brothers, Romulus and Remus. Uh, and basically, according to mythology, they were discovered by a she-wolf, um, a, a female wolf, who raised them as her own children and they grew up to be the founders of the great city of Rome. Um, so you might notice that Rome is a little bit closer to Romulus than it is to Remus. That's because, unfortunately, the two brothers got into a little bit of a fight uh, as the city was being built, and eventually Romulus came on top, uh, came out on top, and uh, you know wound up being the very first king of Rome. And that's also where we get the name Rome from, is from that brother Romulus. So anyway, during this period, you had about seven kings. It's not the longest period of Roman history, but that's definitely where it got its start and started to become more of an organized society. Then you get into the Republican period, which was 509 BC to 29 BC. During this period, the government switched from being, you know, one king who had, you know, the vast majority of power to switching over to a Senate or a council of people, um, which is closer to what a lot of governments have today, if you've heard of a parliament or anything like that. Basically a group of people who are tasked with coming up with political decisions on behalf of the people of Rome. So this was a fairly long period, few hundred years, um, where Rome was ruled this way. And while you did have uh, you know, your council and you had a large number of people who were, you know, charged with giving that voice for the Roman people, the person who sat at the very top was called the council. And they were able to kind of veto decisions or, you know, you know, say, we're going to talk about this today and, you know, kind of lead the direction of what political decisions would be made. Uh, that person was kind of 
the highest up during this time. And one of the most famous consuls, probably the most famous consul is Julius Caesar. Uh, so I'm sure we've heard that name before. Um, if not, that is a uh, sculpture of him, a bust of him on the right. Um, but he was a very, very famous consul um, during uh, Roman history. So then we get to the imperial period, um, which is kind of when things get exciting in, in terms of you know what we really know about Rome when we think of it. So during the imperial period, you switched to an emperor who had total and absolute power. Um, there was still a Senate, there was still a council for parts of it, it kind of broke up here and there. Um, there were still people who had a big political voice in Rome, but the emperor had total power, got to make the big decisions, you couldn't defy the emperor. Um, on the left, we have uh, Augustus, who was the first emperor of Rome, and he brought in a period of peace for Rome, and he started off the imperial period as being something really peaceful. Uh, in stark contrast, you had uh, Emperor Nero, who was said to be the cruelest emperor in Rome, and he basically, uh, he's, he's said to have sat there and listened to the lute being played while the city of Rome was on fire during a really famous siege. So just to show you that during the imperial period, you kind of had big contrasts and big kind of ranges of people who sat as the emperor. Um, some of them really determined for peace and some of them not so much. But other major things that happened during this time were things like the Colosseum being built and a whole bunch of other really famous buildings and art and things like that were going on uh, during the imperial period. So this period again, 28 BC to 476 AD, which is about when the Roman Empire fell or wrapped up. But again, it maybe goes a few more years after that. It's hard to pinpoint the exact dates of the start and finish. Whew. But anyway, that's enough of a, uh, a mouthful on the history of Rome. And thank you guys for bearing with me there. I think it's time to get into what I think is the most fun part, uh, which is Roman architecture. So with that being said, I want to give everyone their first Lego challenge. Before I do, I want to remind everybody of a few things here. The first thing, you don't have to use Legos. Uh, if you don't have any handy or you don't feel like building with them, you're more than welcome. You're encouraged to build with whatever you would like to, whether it's play, uh, Play-Doh or clay, um, pen and paper if you want to draw, uh, or anything else. If you want to stack books and get creative with your building materials, you can do that too. But anyway, that's the first thing I want to remind you of. The other thing I would like to say uh, and really make sure that everybody understands really quick, you guys don't have to build things really fast. You are more than welcome to, in fact, you're supposed to, continue to build your creations as I'm talking. So while we're going through, we're going to talk a whole bunch about the Colosseum here in a minute. Um, you guys can feel free to get to drawing, building, whatever way you're going to uh, reconstruct your Colosseum. You can feel free to do that while I'm talking. So don't feel like you have to do anything right on the spot here. Uh, but anyway, your first Lego challenge is the Colosseum. Uh, so let's get into a little bit. And I want to just also reiterate that you don't have to have, you know, an uber realistic Colosseum. It can be a little bit uh, more simple. That was my best attempt at a Colosseum. So, um, you know, you don't have to get too big and crazy about it. Um, just go with your creativity, let it go wild and have fun with it. Um, anyway. Here's another trivia question for you guys. Uh, how many people could fit in the Colosseum? Uh, so we're about to get into it. You guys saw a big picture of it. How many people do you think could fit in the Colosseum at any given time? Is it A, 50,000, B, 3,000, C, 750, or D, 1 million people? How many people could fit in the Colosseum? So go ahead, you could type it into the chat. You could just kind of have your answer in your head and see if you're right. But let's see, how many people? The answer is A, 50,000 people could fit in the Colosseum. And the Colosseum was built in about, um, it was the early ADs. I wanna say it was like in the 60s AD. So this was a very, very long time ago that the Colosseum was built. 
Uh, and it was able to fit 50,000 people. And there were 50,000 citizens of Rome and more that were, you know, to an extent thriving and living well and living a modern life. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how they did all that, but give you that trivia question at the start, just to kind of show you from the start how incredible the Colosseum really is. Um, so let's look at a couple of little elements to the Colosseum. Um, the top is what it looks like today, and on the bottom we see a picture or a recreation of what it would have looked like in its prime prime time or heyday. Um, so let's start off with how it used to look. With the Colosseum, uh, originally it was complete circular or oval shaped building. It was an arena, right? So as you look at the new pictures, you start to see it has you know pieces that are broken away, unevenness to it. Back in the day, it was one solid symmetrical structure. Um, another big part of it uh, was the awning. So when it was built and people were there watching things in the Colosseum, they actually were able to put shade over them by retracting and putting over this awning that they had. So they could protect spectators from rain, uh, from the elements, everything like that. A uh, couple other major elements to it, you have all the arches, so it's not just like block walls all around it, right? It's all these cool arches and you see on the bottom all the statues. Um, that did a few things. A, it made it cheaper, right? It made it easier to build. You had to use that much less material, right? You, instead of filling in all those walls, you had these big holes in them, right? So you had to use less material. So it would cost less money, it would take less time. Um, and on top of that, that type of structure is actually a lot stronger and more reliable than that solid wall would have been at the time. So more reliable, stands the test of time, cheaper, already sounding pretty good, right? On top of that, it's an arena, right? You need to be able to see what's going on in there. Everybody's going there to see things, right? So you need there to be lighting and there weren't really light bulbs at the time. There weren't big spotlights like we have. So all these arches, all these cutouts, the big opening at the top, it made it so that there was a lot of light in there. And while it was such a big, heavy building, it made the building itself look light and look inviting. Um, so that's enough about uh, how it used to look. How it looks today. So we'll notice a few things. A, it's kind of crumbly, right? There's a lot of stuff that's falling off the Colosseum these days, although it is getting a little bit uh, better. They're definitely doing a lot of, um, you know, preservation work and things like that. But um, a big reason for all of that material re uh, missing um, is that as, you know, the Roman Empire started to fall, the Colosseum went out of popularity, People started kind of taking things from it, building materials to uh, to build other structures. Um, you know, the precious stones that were all around it got taken and stolen and sold off and things like that. Um, invading armies that came through would take things like souvenirs. Um, and even up until recently, people would go to the Colosseum and like chunk a piece out of it and take it home as a, as a souvenir. So that's, you know, largely why uh, the Colosseum is a little bit more crumbly than it used to be today. Um, but it's also an incredibly old building, so that has to do with it. Um, other things to notice, you have a bunch of tiers of seating. Uh, and the final thing that I'll point out is that the floor of the Colosseum seems to be missing there, right? There's that basement space. So we'll talk all about it in a minute, but the Colosseum was used for things like gladiator fights and um, unfortunately animal fights and unfortunately, well, not so unfortunately, animal showings, things like circuses where, you know, they would just have like animals being appreciated, I guess, uh, if you're looking at it as positively as you can. But anyway, um, underneath the Colosseum, they were able to build all these caverns and spaces where all of the animals and the things uh, that were going to be used in the show were kept. Um, the gladiators would hang out there before the fights and everything like that. So that's a really import, important part of the Colosseum, the fact that it had that basement there. Um, but that was not an original part of the Colosseum either, and we'll get to that later on. Really quick, I want to address uh, the elephant in the room for the Colosseum, what went on there. Um, gladiator fights were the primary thing that happened inside the Colosseum. So with gladiator fighting, uh, and we won't get into the nitty gritty of it all, uh, but 
few things were at play. First of all, um, the Colosseum was built by the emperor um, essentially as a gift to the people and as sort of a, a beacon of Rome's success and its might, right? It was something that was just so incredible that they had that made Rome the best, basically. So, so when uh, it was built, basically the goal behind it was to get everybody in Rome to be coming to the same place at the same time to take part in the same experience. So for that reason, all of the gladiator fights, all the events at the Colosseum were free. And it was a gift from the emperor to the people. So for that reason, uh, the emperor was a pretty popular guy, at least when he was inside the Colosseum. Everyone was in there basically, you know, having a ticket that he bought them sort of thing. Um, so that was a major part of it. Everyone could go there. But when you were there, um, you had things like gladiator fighting where uh, people would be fighting each other or fighting, uh, unfortunately, animals. But a big part of uh, gladiator fighting was reenacting stuff. So all the battles, it wasn't just people most of the time going out there just swinging swords at each other. Most of it was people dressing up actually as armies from, you know, the past that Rome had fought off. Um, and basically they would have staged little battles showing, you know, Rome's military might by, you know, fighting off um, people dressed up as the other army. So that was a really big part of it. Um, another major element is that uh, the emperor would have the decision making power if somebody were disarmed in a gladiator fight. You have the famous scene of the emperor having the thumb in the middle and then giving the thumbs up or the thumbs down like you see here in the, uh, the gif. Um, that would basically imply the fate of uh, whoever was disarmed in a gladiator fight. So if you're fighting someone, you knock their sword out of their hand, ev everything would stop and you would look up at the emperor and he would give the thumbs up or thumbs down and that would decide what happened to the person who dropped their sword. Uh, a few other instances where the thumb thing happened, but that's pretty much the basic scenario. Um, so that's pretty much the gist of gladiator fighting. The last thing I'll say about it um, is that gladiators themselves, they were basically um, a mixture of people from criminals to uh, soldiers who wanted to take part in it, soldiers who had done something bad and were being put into it for punishment. Uh, very unfortunately, slaves were often uh, made to be gladiators. Uh, several other people wound up in the Colosseum as a gladiator. Um, but basically, in gladiator culture, if you won one, two, three, four fights, you know, as you started to win more and more, you gained popularity pretty much like no one else in ancient Rome. Uh, the gladiators, especially the, the successful ones, were treated like LeBron James, basically. They were treated like the absolute top players in their field, right? So it was really terrible to be a gladiator, but once you were successful with it, you actually wound up living a pretty good life uh, in terms of, you know, where you are in society in ancient Rome, where you were in society. Um, so really interesting little piece of history, what gladiators were, what they were doing, and the fact that everyone wanted to sit there and watch it happen as well. Uh, so the Colosseum was a really incredible place um, for a lot of reasons, some of them kind of dark, but that's that. What I think is the coolest thing about the Colosseum that uh, I'm really excited to tell you guys about um, is what is called a pneumachia or a pneumachiae, which is essentially a staged naval battle that took place inside the Colosseum. So this was very early on in the Colosseum's history. This is way before um, they had the basement where they kept everything. Uh, they wouldn't really have been able to do this with that kind of basement. So the original floor of the Colosseum, like I was saying earlier, was actually just flat ground. And they were able to build essentially, if you look on the right, um, almost like a giant swimming pool for uh, these boats to have little naval battles in. 
And they weren't fake naval battles either. These were actual battleships that would sail around inside the Colosseum and have little tiny wars in front of an audience. Um, so pretty miraculous thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit in a minute. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about how they actually were able to fill it and drain it and all that. But just in terms of, you know, showing Rome's might and ability, being able to do this is incredible. Um, the way that it was filled up, basically, it would happen when the emperor, like, snapped his fingers and it would drain when he snapped his fingers again. Um, so it, it was something that just, you know, it's incredible enough, but just the idea of it was something that really raised, you know, Rome's, I don't know, stature and raised them up as a society as being something that was unlike anything in the world at the time. So pretty incredible stuff. Um, again, you see on the left what it looks like today, what it looked like back then. Today, it's the carved out floor with the, uh, the basement for everything. Um, and on the right, uh, that's what it would have looked like kind of near the beginning. So uh, this is a zoomed out picture. This is supposed to be the Colosseum with like a few layers of it taken off. So it doesn't look exactly like the Colosseum when you're looking at it, but it's supposed to be the Colosseum and that's what it maybe would have looked like. That many ships in there fighting it out. Uh, so pretty incredible stuff. But eventually uh, the naval battles got so popular, so many people wanted to see them um, and it was, pretty dangerous for the spectators. They had nets and things protecting people, but still, you know, a ship battle going on 40 feet away from you is probably not the safest idea. So eventually uh, they moved them out of the Colosseum. They built their own uh, like arena type thing for the Numachia uh, in a nearby waterway, uh, which that is a sketch of what it might have looked like. It's kind of fallen to history at this point, exactly where it was. Um, but that's what it looks, looked like um, at the time. Uh, but when this happened, when they took the water out of the Colosseum, they were able to do things like altering the stage floor. So you saw all the basement stuff. They were able to keep things below, but they were also able to do some pretty incredible stuff for the time. They had all sorts of trap doors and elevators um, and things like that, where they could raise animals up seemingly from nowhere, which for a lot of people was like mind bending and like seeing magic at the time because there was nothing like that. A lion just comes up out of the floor would have been mind blowing, right? So again, shows how much of a um, feat of engineering the Colosseum is, right? And just shows how, you know, incredible and successful the Roman Empire was, I guess. Um, but anyway, that being said, we'll move on from the Colosseum here because we're quickly running out of time here and I want to get some questions from y'all. Um, we talked about how the Colosseum would have been filled with water. That would have happened with Roman aqueducts. So your second challenge here is to build a Roman aqueduct. They're pictured right here behind. Again, build while I'm talking here and we're gonna see plenty more pictures of them. But that is your second challenge. Um, and I believe I have a, uh, another trivia question here in a second, but this is what a Lego aqueduct might look like. So throwing that image up there for a second for you guys for uh, a little bit of inspiration. But again, you'll see plenty more of them in a second. So, oh. Trivia question at the end. Let's get through the info first. Um, so how does an aqueduct work? How did they fill up the Colosseum with water and get it out of there, right? Um, it was all done by using aqueducts. So the way that these worked, if you look at the top left here, they were built in multiple tiers and they were built on a little bit of an angle. And so what that meant was that any water that would be on um, the aqueduct would continue to move reliably unless something big fell into it and got in its way, that water would continue to flow without the use of any kind of pump or electricity or anything like that. So that alone was really big, being able to have water come to you, right? For most of human history, we have had to go to water. 
um, there are still many people in the world who have to go to their water source, like a lake or a river or something like that. The Romans were able to figure out getting the water to come to them. So that was a big deal. Um, so that is part of what makes it so incredible. But another important part of them was that, again, we see the arches, right? So they were built um, with less material. They could go up really fast. Um, and what the different tiers allowed them to do was build over obstacles, right? So if you look at the bottom left, it's totally uneven, right? It's able to go down into a lake and come back out of it. That type of structure made it so that the aqueduct could go for all these miles and miles and miles, regardless of what it passed over. So really cool. Um, just to tell you guys a little bit more about how they worked and give you kind of a visual on it. Um, on the right, uh, just another example of, you know, how extreme they could get with making it work around uh, natural obstacles. But basically, if you look at the bottom left picture, they were built, many of them in different ways from this, but this was a general build for a Roman aqueduct. It was all built on that slant, <clears throat> flowing down from a water source like a lake or a river, usually a lake. Um, Essentially, it would flow down, it would go through multiple tanks that would allow dirt to settle out of it, that would allow um, the water to stay clean by being covered. Then it would go into a distribution tank where multiple people could get water from it. Um, in some cases, it would go directly from an aqueduct, kind of through a filtration system and then into a big public fountain or a bath. <clears throat> Pardon me. So another big part of Roman history that was pretty important that we maybe take for granted today, bathing, right? Romans were able to build these massive bath systems and bath rooms with running water. Um, I say hesitantly and in quotes because it wasn't, you know, a flushing toilet like we know today. Um, but those aqueducts, they allowed for so much incredible stuff that we take for granted, right? Not just these naval battles but things as simple as drinking water and bathing and bathrooms. It made Rome very successful to not have to deal with all of those things, to be able to use their time otherwise, right? Um, but I figured it's also kind of a funny little piece of history. On the right here is a Roman bathroom. So I don't know, maybe you can enter in the chat if you'd ever be willing to use a Roman bathroom. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think that I would. But anyway, it was a really big innovation for the time, all of that stuff. And it was largely thanks to the aqueduct. Um, so I have your last trivia question of the day for you. How long is the largest Roman aqueduct? So how far were they actually able to transport all of that water in a reliable way? What do you guys think? Is it A, 3,000 miles? B, 1,100 feet, C, 82 miles, or D, 295 miles. So go ahead, take your guess. Going to jump into it quick because I'm running out of time. The answer is C, 82 miles. So that's a very, very long, long time to build one solid structure, an 82-mile long structure to bring them water. Pretty incredible thing just shows like the ingenuity of uh, Romans with their building. So I'm going to just rapid fire through a couple more little uh, pretty and beautiful things around Rome. Uh, and I really want to jump over to a Q&A and give you guys a chance to uh, share some of your thoughts and questions. So if I'm talking fast through this, I'm sorry. But uh, just to give you a little bit of a taste of it, a really important building in Rome is the Pantheon. So with the Pantheon, we see a lot of blending of styles, a lot of really cool things at play. At one time, it had the largest dome in the world. So if you look at it now, it's, it's pretty big, but there's larger ones out there now. That was the largest one in the world at one point. So other things we see in the front, a big part of Roman culture was copying the Greeks with their art and architecture. Um, this front of the building is very Greek architecture, um, but in the back and with the dome, that's where you start to see Roman innovation with their building and everything like that. In the dome up top, you see all the squares missing out of uh, 
you know, it almost looks like there's big chunks taken out of it. Again, using less material, making it lighter so that the dome didn't have to hold up so much weight. Um, and then the big elephant in the room about the Pantheon, there's a hole in the ceiling, right? Um, so the hole uh, was meant to signify or um, resemble a few things. It was supposed to resemble God's light coming down and, you know, kind of like a, a picture up to the heavens and things like that. But other cool things that it did, um, it allowed rainwater to come in, which A, cleaned the floors for free, um, and B, back in the day, they actually had constructed a grill on top or like a little metal mesh on top that when rain fell through it, it made this big pattern happen on the floor. So they're trying to fight to rebuild one and bring it back, but right now that doesn't exist. That was an old feature of the Pantheon. Final Pantheon feature I'll talk about is that the floor, in order to deal with all that rain, is actually all on a little bit of a tilt. So it naturally cleans and drains itself. So pretty incredible building. They clean it more on top of that, especially these days to preserve it, but really cool piece of architecture and really beautiful. One last thing I'll talk about is the Vatican City. It's a country within the city of Rome. So the Vatican City, it's where the Pope lives. We won't get into all the religious talk, but I will say it's a really crazy, beautiful example of architecture um, and just, again, shows off, you know, how incredible Rome is as a city in terms of its buildings. Um, so just looking at, you know, any one of these pictures um, on the left here, really pick your poison. Beautiful architecture, beautiful vaulting, using tricks to, you know, lower the amount of material you're using. Um, symmetry and making things match is a really big part of it. Um, things like vaulting, which is how uh, the ceiling is kind of curving on the top, also help to lighten the material and make the building stronger. So I won't talk your ear off about it. I think what really makes the Vatican City the most special in my heart is the Sistine Chapel, um, which is a chapel within the Vatican City that uh, was painted by Michelangelo uh, and just has tons and tons of famous art all over it. So I think we're ready to get into the q and um, I don't want to talk your ear off any more about Rome and I want to see if you guys have questions, but that's the basic gist of, uh, ancient Roman history for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thomas. And we have some really wonderful questions coming in. Now, before we get to those questions, I want to make sure that students have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for that selfie. And as a quick reminder, if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors and the Museum of D Design Atlanta, you'll be entered to win that Ancient Adventures Camp subscription, where you and your fellow explorers will get to learn about all sorts of ancient civilizations through live in-class activities, after camp challenges and some featured celebrity content. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Thomas for that selfie. So Thomas, take it away. All right, guys. So if anyone wants to hold up any builds for your selfie, um, I would love to see some of the builds that you guys have. Um, but let's all go ahead, hold up any builds you have, and let's lean into the camera and show off those pretty smiles. And let's do our selfie. Right. All right, wonderful. And if you didn't get a chance to snap that selfie just yet, Thomas is going to be here very, very excitedly answering questions for the next couple of minutes. So you're welcome to at that point as well. Uh, now we had lots of really wonderful questions related to the lesson. But first, uh, probably the most powerful question that we've gotten from the class uh, has to do with your background. So what's up? <laughs> What's up with the skateboards? Talk to me there. What's up with the skateboards? That's a great question. So that falls into uh, Moda and how wonderful of a museum I'm lucky enough to work at. So we celebrate all things design, truly everything out there. Um, so one exhibit we did a couple years back was having to do with skateboard deck design um, and just how long, uh, you know, how long of a way that sport has come. 
Um, so we do run uh, some skateboard related classes. If anyone's interested, I'll actually be running a class on uh, building skateboards where you'll get a kit with a skateboard deck and grip tape and wheels and trucks and all that. Uh, and we'll be building them. So if you want to uh, look into that, you can just go ahead to our Moda website. It's not up quite yet. It'll be going up in the next week or so. Um, but if you just go to museumofdesign.org, um, it'll, it'll give you that option to sign up for that class and we can build some skateboards together. Very, very cool. And uh, as a quick reminder for those of you in the class who are following along and where we might have moved a little bit quickly for you to complete your masterpieces, uh, by all means, this recording will be available to you all. So feel free to check it out and build along, use some of those photos as inspiration if you haven't quite gotten the chance to already. Uh, now, we also had a lot of students who agreed with you that the uh, the water bearing capability of the Colosseum was pretty cool and also pretty interesting just in terms of the technology back in the day. So could you talk to us a little bit about how they were able to do that? Yeah, so it's it's still kind of a little piece of, you know, historical mystery exactly how they did it because when they reconstructed that new floor uh, to, to have, you know, the basement to it, they kind of tore out and got rid of the piping and the things that they originally had down there that would have filled it up. So there's a few ideas that have been drawn out about how exactly they might have specifically filled it up and drained it. But from people's accounts, there were little doors in the side of it that would just open and water would start rushing in. And then at the end, the same doors, um, there were, a lower set of doors, but the same look to them would open up and the water would all drain out that way. Um, so we do know that the, the only way that they could have had that much water get to the Colosseum um, would have been through the use of aqueducts and there were several close by at the time. So they might have kind of diverted and built a small structure to bring water over to the Colosseum. They also found evidence that there might have been some tanks below the Colosseum. So there might have been some water that they had on hand just to make it happen quicker. Uh, but there's a, a lot of evidence that also supported and there was about 5,000 gallons in there at a time. So, you know, they definitely probably would have had, you know, a combination of tanks and water flowing in directly from an aqueduct. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's, it's a great question because it's, it's one that many, many people have as to like exactly how they did it, but it's kind of a, a little, little mystery. Wow. That is amazing, amazing, particularly considering that they didn't necessarily have all the same sealants and materials that we would think of today for that sort of capability. Um, yeah. We also had some students who were wondering, we got to see a couple of your Lego models today. Uh, do you have any other favorite materials to use when you are modeling? Do you make creations out of anything other than those Legos? Um, let's see, I, I definitely like uh, drawing. I love drawing. Um, I love building things uh, with paper. I've, I've run a few origami classes and, and kind of have started learning how to fold origami, uh, which is really fun and actually not terribly difficult. So I really encourage you guys to try building with that. You don't have to, you know, most people think of origami and think of like a, a swan or a little bird. You can do incredible stuff. You can build buildings. You can build obviously planes, but not paper airplanes. Um, you can build like reconstructed planes and stuff just out of paper. So I found a lot of fun, especially, you know, in quarantine all through 2020, kind of messing around with that. Um, but other fantastic resources, um, if you guys want to ever go online and try your hand at them, things like Tinkercad, um, Scratch, um, and uh, Legos Digital Design, uh, which is on their website, a free thing that you can download, uh, where basically you're able to build online with different shapes and things like that. Uh, I always love messing around with those and kind of tinkering around and coming up with creations on there. 
That is awesome. And it sounds like we could, you know, combine our understanding and learning of history with our creativity there, even with one of these new platforms, one of these online platforms to see how we might structure something from the distant past when internet wasn't quite a thing uh, using that technology we have available. Um, and I know you spoke about a lot of really, really cool and really interesting architecture and how it came together at the time. Uh, is there any favorite, I'll say, uh, architectural elements of history that we haven't had the chance to talk about today that you think is worth the class knowing? Hmm. Well, there are a ton, for sure, um, especially in Roman architecture. Um, but one thing that I can actually share with you guys very quickly here, um, one of my favorite things in ancient Rome um, is what's called Trajan's Column. So let me open that up for you guys, if that's okay, Haley. Um, so this is Trajan's Column, which is in Rome. So Trajan was a, uh, I believe he was a general. Um, I don't think he was ever a ruler, but I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But one of my favorite pieces in Rome is Trajan's Column because basically, it's a narrative, it's a story wrapped around a giant pole, a giant column, <laughs> um, where basically, as you're looking up close here, it's all different scenes of soldiers going to war, being at war, um, winning the war, getting all the spoils of war, and then returning home. And it all takes place on this column that you're able to walk around and see all these pieces of. Um, and Trajan himself was buried underneath it, um, but his body was moved um, at one point in history for a few different reasons. But anyway, um, I would say if you're looking for one more thing to maybe build or to go ahead and Google after class to, you know, satisfy your curiosity about ancient Rome, look up Trajan's column. Pretty cool. Wow, absolutely. And uh, certainly a lot we can learn just by looking at the architecture of places in different periods of history. Um, now it is about that time, but I would love to, uh, to hear if you have any other closing thoughts, anything else that you'd like to leave the class with before we wrap things up for today's lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thank you everybody. Um, it's always wonderful to get to share um, a little bit of knowledge and some cool facts about Rome. I hope you guys had some fun with it. Um, but I really wanna encourage you guys to just go out there and let your creativity kind of guide you. Um, there's a lot of paths to walk in life and don't let creativity get stomped out. Um, design is everywhere, creativity is all around you and every single one of you has the ability to make the world just that much more special with the things that you do. So just keep that in mind as you go forward, as you design things, um, maybe try to, you know, think big like the Romans did and build big things in your life, do big things. Um, but either way, I know everyone's going to do great. Um, but thank you again, guys. It was, it was so, so wonderful to have this opportunity to, to, to come and talk to you guys. Uh, and I hope you had a great time. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. I know I certainly learned quite a bit about the overlap of architecture and history. Uh, thank you so much to the entire team at Museum of Design Atlanta. And we hope to see everybody back in another Star Course series lesson soon. But in the meantime, don't forget about those selfies, post to Instagram and tag us here at Varsity Tutors and Museum of Design Atlanta to win. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye, guys.